Welcome to the Pangburn Philosophy Podcast. This is Travis Pangburn. I thought I would give a brief introduction to this podcast just to say hi, because this is our first official podcast, and we are really excited that we're going to be doing a lot of these different talks with many of the high-profile speakers that we get to work with on a regular basis. We will also be featuring discussions with some less notable people, some of my friends and colleagues discussing various world issues. We will also have a live call-in aspect once in a while to this program, and we look forward to hearing your feedback on how we can improve the podcast. My conversation with Jordan Peterson was very interesting. His passion for his work is immense, and I truly respect that kind of passion as I can closely relate to it. I'm a very passionate person, sometimes even to a fault. Under my definition of atheism, that is, if someone claims that a god exists or that gods exist, I will say, I don't believe that claim because I haven't been shown sufficient evidence to warrant belief. If Jordan believes in an imaginary god and admits that it is so, Santa Claus then exists. All right, without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Jordan Peterson. Welcome to the Penguin Philosophy Podcast. I am here today with Dr. Jordan Peterson, best-selling author with his most recent hit, 12 Rules for Life, and a clinical psychologist extraordinaire. Cleaning your room, literally and as a metaphor. I was going to ask you, Jordan, what about one's office? Because mine is a literal shit show. Well, it's hard to say. Does it suit your purposes? That's I, the real issue. I feel like it does, but I... I I'm overwhelmed at times mm -hmm. by the state that it's in. Well, what I would recommend practically is that every time you go into your office, you spend like three minutes cleaning it. No more than three, because you'll probably do that, right? And then you can whittle away at it incrementally, which is a very good way to solve problems. Hmm. And then you could find out over time if having it in a more ordered state was actually stopping you from avoiding because one of the things that that kind of chaotic space does, and it's also indicative of, it, what it does is increase the probability that you'll avoid. Because the messes are unspecified, and therefore they, well, what they do technically is activate your predator, your predator avoidance systems, which is probably mm. not all that good. So you could experiment with it. You know, the other thing you can do is walk into a space like that. And you have to ask yourself, take a look around, attend to it, look at it, because you probably won't because you're probably avoiding it visually. But take a look at, to take a look at it and see, if, see how it sits with you. You know, as if you're, in, as if you're asking someone you don't know, you know, because you don't know yourself that well. And you might find that it actually doesn't sit with you very well. Now, you know, there are reasons for mess that are sometimes not mere lack of discipline and attention. You know, you might be preoccupied with other things necessarily and it got beyond you for some reason temporarily. Or maybe there's a method in your madness. But generally, when people are surrounded by disorder, it's something that's crept up on them and it's actually not good for them. Right. Okay. Well, um, so we're, we're here in Toronto. You're going to be taking the stage with Matt Dillahunty, former Southern Baptist, fundamentalist Christian for 25 years, believed he was meant to be a preacher, now a prominent figure in the promotion of secular humanism. So that's still a preacher. What are the similarities that you see between uh, kind of what you, what you would call a preacher of secular humanism and a preacher of Christianity? Well, there's, there seems at least to be the commonality of, let's say, theatrical approach because a church in many ways is a theater, or what is really the case is the theater is the secularized church. That's actually the developmental progression. And atheism seems to have be developed, at least in part, in some of its 
manifestations, let's say, into something approximating a movement. And you could say, well, it's usually based in something philosophically like humanism, which is a form of, from my perspective, from, from my, let's say, psychological perspective, it's a religious belief system with fundamental axioms that are as grounded in faith as the next set of stories about how to conduct yourself. So I would just say, generally speaking, that the humanist types are unconscious of the mythological substructure of their beliefs. That doesn't mean they don't have them. They have mythological substructures because you can't escape from them. Our thought is embedded in metaphor. There's no way out of that. So that would be the similarities. And then there's the evangelical aspect of it too. You know, there's, there's the sense that I get from people like Dawkins and Harris and Dillahunty although I'm less familiar with him, that there's a mission to be accomplished, you know, to rid the world of a particular form of scourge, which generally is construed as something like irrationality. And like, who's in favor of irrationality? Fair enough. And it's certainly the case that religious believers can be irrational. But my sense, generally speaking, with the, with the vocal atheist types is they've never really contended with the... With the with the real thinkers on the religious front. So, you know, taking on the fundamentalist Christians, it's like, well, in some ways it's like shooting fish in a barrel. It's not really, I mean, I'm not trying to be derogatory. I understand the fundamentalist position and I have some appreciation for it. I know that the fundamentalist types are trying desperately to support an ethos that they regard as highly valuable. And I have plenty of sympathy for that perspective. But as an intellectual enterprise, arguing against fundamentalism is really not a particular challenge. So that's how I look at it anyways. Um, and I think uh, uh, maybe why it seems like a good way to spend your time as, as from an atheistic standpoint is that uh, the hope is maybe some of these fundamental belief systems that are fundamentally anti-scientific may be eradicated by reason. Yeah, the thing is, I don't think so, because I think that the, the real issue at stake is never really, is never really dealt with. There is a, see, the, the atheist types, as far as I can tell, won't admit to the utility of the metaphoric viewpoint. And that's a great mistake on their part. Like it's, an, it's a mistake that's really grounded in a, fu a fundamental sort of, sort of blindness. Now, the problem is, is that there's an antithesis between the scientific viewpoint and, let's say, the metaphoric viewpoint, and it's an antithesis that we don't really know how to overcome. But by telling the metaphoric types that they should abandon their metaphors and flip to the scientific viewpoint, that's no way to get them to do that, because they're not going to abandon their metaphoric viewpoint any more than the atheists are. I mean, although they don't admit to the fact that they are grounded in metaphor just like everyone else. So I don't think it's an, uh, a particularly useful approach. I don't have anything against the attempt to, let's say, enlighten people with regards to certain fundamental scientific realities. I mean, I think the the idea that the Earth is 4,000 years old, I think it was Bishop Barclay, but that might be wrong, who calculated that 150 years ago or thereabouts. I may be wrong about all of that, but um, the, the, the fundamentalists confuse the biblical texts with scientific theory. Well, that's not useful. The people who wrote the Bible weren't scientists, obviously, right. since there weren't any scientists until about 500 years ago. So that's just self-evident. Whatever they were doing was something other than science. And to point out to the fundamentalists that religion is not science is... It does, the problem is it doesn't address the problem. Religion isn't science, but it's something. And that something has to be grappled with deeply. And I don't see that among the atheist community. Yeah, I think the uh, one of the main problems that I see when I look at a belief system that subscribes to an all-powerful, all-knowing being is that that being may communicate in a way that's harmful or damaging to that person. For instance, if the being was to deliver a message that the child that they have raised needs to be with Christ in heaven. And, and the only way to deliver that child to Christ in heaven would be to smother the child. Well, I think we could agree that that would be a problem. Yes. And I mean, there's no, there's, there's no 
obviously there are religious psychopathologies. Mm -hmm. They're well documented in the clinical literature. I mean, you see religious delusions in schizophrenia. You see religious delusions in manic depressive disorder. To the degree that it's an instinct, and it does seem to be an instinct, which is also something I don't think the atheists really grapple with, it's right. something that can go wrong, like most biological phenomena, let's say. Mm -hmm. And your, your, your objection points to a deeper problem, which is the, the problem of validation. Like if you have a revelation, the question is, how do you discern the evil spirits from the good? It's a classical religious problem sure. in some sense. And, it, and it's not a trivial problem. It's a, it's a true problem. And it's a philosophical problem and a practical problem as well. That doesn't mean it can't be done. But, but uh, yeah. Uh, but I don't think that that in and of itself is a fundamental objection, let's say, to the religious instinct any more than the fact that there are pathologies of perception or pathologies of sensation that go along with those instincts as well. Mm -hmm. So how far do, do your particular belief systems go um, when, when you think about God? I mean, do you, do you believe in a literal creator or is, is this more of a metaphor to you? as far as how the cosmos well i'm not be. sure where metaphor touches reality right like metaphor is an extraordinarily powerful tool for dealing with reality and it isn't obvious to me that our reality isn't a lot more metaphorical than we think it is like i'm much less convinced that our standard scientific viewpoint let's say the enlightenment scientific viewpoint is in any means complete i don't really believe it is i think that what we don't understand about the universe is, is vast in its expanse. For example, we don't understand consciousness, not even a bit. And people have been hitting consciousness pretty hard from a scientific perspective in the psychological and biological community for about 35, 40 years. And I don't really think they've got anywhere with it. I've read a couple of books that I thought were reasonably good. I read one called The User Illusion, which I thought was good. Jeffrey Gray had a pretty good book on consciousness. I didn't like Daniel Dennett's book at all. I think it was, as his critics said, consciousness explained away. There's lots of other things we don't... We also don't really understand the problem of the observer. Like, t like phenomena, extant phenomena, seem dependent in some strange sense. And this is without having to make any allusions to the mysteries of quantum physics, which is always a dangerous thing to do. Extant phenomena seem to require a subject, a conscious subject, in order to have any describable existence. And that's another thing that we don't really know what to make of. And so I think there are, and so you were asking me about my beliefs. I've spent a lot of time studying religious stories, stories period. But if you study stories deeply enough, first of all, we think in stories. Okay. We, we organize our lives in stories. We organize our perceptions with stories. There's no escaping from them. And stories have a structure. And the structure has a grammar. And you can tell that because you can tell the difference between something that's a story and something that isn't. Even though there's a diverse, diverse range of stories. There's something about the, the set of all stories that makes them stories. And when you look at what makes the set of all stories stories, you're in the religious fundament. That's what you're in. And the religious stories are, they're meta stories. That's one way of thinking about it. So the hero myth is a very good example of that. And the hero myth, the hero myth is true insofar as human beings are true. Now, when I talked to Sam Harris, we augured in on the definition of truth, but I think Harris was wrong. He was after me because I refused to use true in the same manner that scientists use it. But true is a much older word than scientifically true. There's the true of an arrow's flight, and there's the true of your heart, and there's the true of your aim, and there's the true of metal, and like true is a very, very richly connotated word. And the hero myth, which is the idea that you should voluntarily confront the unknown despite your vulnerability, and that that will lead you to redemption, let's say, because that's how you would phrase it religiously, that's true. It's as true as anything we know. It might be more true than anything we know. And that's a strange thing because that's an indication of where metaphor, because the hero myth is a metaphor, that's a place where the metaphorical touches the real. And I don't think we understand that at all. And I don't think the atheist community... The thing that bothers me, I would say, about the, 
let's call them the celebrity atheists, is that, as far as I can tell, they've never read any of the people... They've never read any of the people who would give them a real run for their money. Like, if you're going to play in this domain, you have to read Dostoevsky. It's not optional. You have to read Tolstoy. That's not optional either. You should read Mircea Eliade, the... the um, was he Romanian? I think he was Romanian. Romanian, yeah. Yeah, yes. and who, who, the scholar of religion, who's, who's a genius, and who wrote like 20 books, and including a history of religious ideas, which is an absolutely profound set of volumes. You should read Eric Neumann, who wrote The Great Mother and the Origins and History of Consciousness. And you should read Jung, and he has about 20 volumes, not counting his seminars. And I don't, or, and you should read Nietzsche as well, and that's just a good starting place, you know. And it isn't obvious to me that the celebrity atheist types have done their damn homework. These people were smart. Like, I've read a lot, and I've read a lot of science, thousands of papers and hundreds of books, and they weren't easy books. I know when something's well written and when the person's reading it, who's writing it, is above and beyond the ordinary in terms of their intellectual ability. And Jung, for example, was an incalculable genius. He was as smart as Nietzsche, maybe smarter, and that's, that's pretty much as high as it goes. And if you don't know that literature, you don't know what you're talking about. It's as simple as that. And if you don't know what you're talking about, then, well, like Dawkins, for example, is very well armed on the evolutionary side, on the evolutionary biology side. But he, he, he treats Christianity, for example, as if, it's, as if the highest forms of Christian thought are encapsulated in fundamentalist, like American, U.S., American fundamentalist Christianity. Well, that's just palpably absurd. So it, he's not, that's a straw man problem. And this is a big problem, the straw man problem. So, and there's another problem too, which is, as far as I can tell, the fundamental presuppositions of our culture are metaphysical. So for example, the notion of natural right, right? The notion of natural right is predicated on the idea that there's something intrinsically valuable about each human being, metaphysically valuable, let's say. And there's no evidence for that as a factual statement, right? Factually, we're all unbelievably diverse and different, and perhaps there's no reason to treat a human being any different than you'd treat a rat, let's say. The animal rights activists have made that case. Well, but we have these metaphysical presuppositions at the base of our culture. The, the doctrine of human rights, for example, that's predicated on the idea of intrinsic human value, and that's fundamentally embedded in a religious context. That grew out of Judeo-Christianity. And the thing is, is that, A, it's really functional. Societies that believe that and act it out, which is the best indication of belief, they really work. Societies that don't believe that get tribal and murderous pretty damn fast. And then you can also look at people's behavior, like if you're having a conversation with a committed atheist and you don't treat them as if they're a divine locale of consciousness engaged in the heroic myth, then all they're going to do is get irritated and angry and not even notice that. So I would say, well, they say they don't believe, but they act as if they believe. So, and for me, it's action. So when people say, well, do you believe in God? I think, well, what the hell do you mean by that? Like, what? That's a really complicated question. And for me, it's like, well, actions speak louder than words. And, and, and that's, I suppose, an existentialist perspective to some degree. The belief is best re reflected in action. But I think the, the, the celebrity atheist types, you know, they believe that the West and its humanistic presuppositions are a consequence of the Enlightenment. And that also staggers me because someone like Dawkins, for example, and Harris to a, to a lesser degree, they pride themselves on their evolutionary approach. It's like, okay, fine, let's play that game. How long ago was the Enlightenment? 500 years. Who cares? How long has, have human beings had a religious instinct? 150,000 years? 300,000 years? As far back as language, we don't know, maybe as far back as the creation of fire or the, the, the taming of fire, which would be some millions of years. We don't know. There's a religious instinct. It's a human universal. It's like, you're going to take that seriously? Are you going to hand wave about the fact that our ethics were derived 500 years ago? When, when none of the scientific evidence suggests that. There's evidence for the emergence of ethic-like behavior in chimpanzees and wolves and rats and all sorts of animals. It's like, what, their enlightenment? That's grounded in the enlightenment as well? It's not serious, this stuff. And it's, it's not good because it needs to be taken seriously. Right. So I, I hear most of that. If someone is to claim that a god has created 
the cosmos. Should that not be tested? Isn't that a scientific claim that can be tested? You can construe it as a scientific claim, but the, the claim, let, let's, let's make it more concrete. Let's take sure. the biblical claim. The Bible is a series of stories. And then the question is, well, how do you interpret a story? And the answer is, with great difficulty. And here's why. A story consists of words, single words, and each word is in a phrase. So the word has to be interpreted within the confine of the phrase. And the phrase in the sentence, and the sentence in the paragraph, and the, and the paragraph in the chapter, and then the chapter in the sequence of chapters, and all the sequence of chapters in the entire corpus. But that, that doesn't exhaust the problem with regards to, say, Christianity, because there's a huge extra-biblical context within which all of that is interpreted as well. So trying to point to a sentence and saying, here's what that means, is like, they're not, it's not a set of propositions, like a sequence of scientific hypotheses. So to say that it should be tested in the same way mixes two modalities of thought. My preference is to try to understand what the claim means. So the claim means something like, as far as I can tell, so if you look at the opening of Genesis, for example, that consciousness gives rise to, to being as a consequence of the confrontation with potential. That's the idea. Is that, so the way that that's stated in a narrative sense is that God, whatever God is, uses the word, which is an unbelievably complex co concept. I don't think there is a more complex concept, psychologically speaking or philosophically speaking, that I've ever encountered than the idea of the word. But God right. uses the word to extract habitable order out of a pre-existent potential. And human beings are made in that image. I think, yeah, there, there's something about that that's right. Because what our consciousness does, as far as I can tell, we're not determined like clocks, as, as Harris would have it, for example. I don't think that that's accurate at all. I think what we do is confront something like an, an infinite potential in a, in a constrained manner, because we're constrained creatures, is we confront the infinite potential of the future. And we use our consciousness to make decisions and cast that potential into reality. And what the opening of Genesis is making reference to, and, and this isn't only true of Genesis, by the way, this is true of many cosmogonic myths, is that there's some integral relationship between the unknown, so that would be potential, consciousness, which is the thing that encounters potential and casts it into order, into reality, and reality and order itself. And those are like the three fundamental constituent elements of reality. So the mytho for the mythological, see, in the mythological world, the world isn't made out of things. And, and, you know, the world really isn't made out of things. So, the, the, uh, the Democritus, who, who formulated the atomic hypothesis, the Greek, he said that things, reality, was made out of atoms and space. Now, the space part actually turns out to be really important, because the materialists tend to think of things as made of atoms. And say, well, everything's made of atoms. It's like, yeah, yeah, just wait a second. That's not exactly right. They're made out of atoms and space. And the thing about space is that it allows the atoms to be arranged in patterns. And then the patterns have their own reality. You're a musician. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what music expresses. So each note is an atom. But the notes aren't isolated phenomena. They're woven into these complex, this complex interplay of patterns. And that's an analogy of, the, of reality, which is why music speaks so deeply to people. And so music has this, or the reality, like music, has this intensely multi, multiple layer patterned nature. And that patterned nature is not something that's easily reducible to a pure deterministic atomic perspective. It doesn't work. And it's not even real because the world is really made out of patterns. And so the mythological world tries to take the fact of the patterns into account. That's one way of looking at it. See, you, you, today, when we were talking just before this mm -hmm. podcast, you said that if you had to pick something you believed in, let's say you'd believe in music. Yeah. And see, that's a very interesting thing, because music is a, is a metaphysical representation of sorts, a metaphoric representation. That's another way of thinking about it. And it produces the intimation of deep meaning, which is why, and it speaks to virtually everyone, right? Even cynics. And the reason music does that is because it, it presents the unfolding of being as the harmonious interplay between patterns, but also requires the listener. 
And the meaning that emerges as a consequence of you confronting those patterns, that meaning, that's, that's the instinct for meaning. And that's also the thing that's facilitated in, I would say, the deepest of religious thought. Because the religious thinkers, the truly religious thinkers, would say, try to maintain yourself in that space of entrancement by meaning that is indicated to you by music. Because the arts, of course, point the way, as, mm -hmm. as everyone has always known, I would say. So, anyways, again, I would say in the, in the celebrity atheist community, such things are not taken with due seriousness. And I think that's a real problem. And, and I think uh, I see a way without having to go to religion um, or to belief in God where art can fulfill that need that we have. And, and I think um, the same pleasure that can uh, be acquired from uh, religious belief, I believe we can get that kind of artistic inspiration from well, art. Well, the question is there that, see, I would say in some sense that's the last... Look, we could say that there's all sorts of different religious phenomena. And some of them are articulated as explicit beliefs. And those are the ones that are most amenable to rational criticism and the most likely to expire because of that. But then there's other religious phenomena that are much more difficult to tear apart rationally. Ritual, dance, art, music, beauty, and all of those things have been used, for example, inside cathedrals, in other religious mm -hmm. ceremonies, yeah. to heighten the religious sense. The artistic world is a pointer to the, to the religious world. Now, if you're rationalistic and you've criticized your explicit religious beliefs out of existence, perhaps for valid reasons, you're going to default to the pre-verbal manifestation of the same impulse. And it's much more ineradicable. Which I think is partly why music has become such a dominant force in our culture. Is the religious, we, we require religious grounding. Without it you're hopeless, by definition, because what you need to not be hopeless is meaning. And some things speak to you in a meaningful way. Now, you may say, well, I can't get the meaning from the explicit statements of religion. My, my rational mind criticizes those statements to death and leaves them not only dead for me, but even, I'm, it even makes me antipathetic towards them. But what will happen then is you'll fall down a level of abstraction into something like music or dance or art, if, if you're fortunate, if you have the temperament for that. Or, or perhaps you'll just fall into something like nihilism, which is a much more catastrophic consequence. I agree. But art and beauty and literature and music, they po they're pointers. They're pointers in some sense to a transcendent domain. That's why they have their power. And the, 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 the essence of that transcendent domain is the same. It's the ground from which religious notions spring. It's the same thing. So, you know, and if you look at this developmentally or say... Anthropo anthropologically, this is completely evident. Before our culture differentiated itself so extremely, dance and music and art and chanting and poetry, all of that was all integrated into one solid cultural form that was essentially religious in its nature. It's been fragmented and, and differentiated in our culture, which for better or for worse, but you don't have to trace it back very far until you see all of that as the unity that makes culture a reality. And it's, it's not the transmission of explicit statements of fact about the structure of the world. That isn't what makes up culture. Culture is something more like a musical dance that we all engage in. And again, I don't see that fact, since we like to talk about facts, mm -hmm. I don't see that fact being addressed seriously by the, by the uh, celebrity atheist types. Right. They tend to write that off. Music, it's an epiphenomenon. It's like, no, actually, it's not. That's just wrong. You can't even understand language properly unless you can understand music because music has a link language has a musical element so yeah and i see um uh, i get the concept of art being pointers now and and i and i understand the religiosity of music and 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 how how that feels being a party you know you hear that that song at the right time your favorite song live with other people and you get that charge and I get that. Yeah, feeling. that's the thing, that charge. So, so I get that aspect. Mm -hmm. 
but where I always kind of laugh out loud is once uh, a supernatural being of some kind or a god is then implemented because I don't see a need for an idol like that. Well, like I said, you don't want to be simple-minded about these sorts of things. Like once you've got to the point... When I, when I listen to Dawkins talk, for example, about religion and, and his criticisms of fundamentalism, I think, well, you've dipped your toe in the ocean. It's like, yeah, okay, you've got the obvious criticisms right, but you haven't started to grapple with the real questions. Like that, that sense that grips you, let's say when you're playing music, that, that's a really mm-hmm. good example. Yeah. Here's a question. Just what the hell's going on? Like, so imagine what you're doing, eh? Like when you're, when you're let's say you're, you're improvising with a bunch of people. Mm-hmm. So first of all, weirdly enough, you can do it on the fly. And it's really complicated. So you're generating these patterns on the fly, right? And you're really into it. It grips you. It grips your whole body. If you start to think about it consciously, you'll screw up, right? It's it has true, to yes. flow. It, it's not a left brain activity, technically speaking. It's a right brain activity. It has to flow. So your whole body, you have to be embodied in the music. And you have to participate in that process of having the patterns unfold. But interestingly enough, you can do that with a bunch of other people at the same time. You can get on the same wavelength. And there's something really entrancing about that entrainment, right? And then the whole audience can participate in that. And that's when the joint gets rocking, right? And everyone's thrilled about that. They're all moving together, right? And that moving together, that's a primary cultural phenomena. What you want in your culture is for people to move together. And you know that music grounds culture. Like, people have their subcultures that are based in music. Well, that's because music, since time immemorial, has been used to cement people together, to have them move together, and to occupy the same pattern space as as the substructure of the culture within within which they're embedded. And to ignore the primary religious nature of that, or to confuse that, (laughs) to ignore the primary religious nature of that, because you can say... Here's some explicit statements that some religions have made that I can criticize rationally is to be blind to the much more profound relationship between the meaning evoked by such rituals, let's say, and the primary religious impulse. And that's the other thing is that there's no doubt that the religious experience is part and parcel of human biology. It's not a secondary cultural overlay. First of all, it can be elicited in all sorts of ways, and I think the most obvious one is through art and music. But it can certainly be elicited reliably by pharmacological agents. And it can be induced by all sorts of different rituals, fasting and chanting and dancing and and sensory deprivation and dreaming and trance states and vision. There's lots of ways for it to be induced, even electromagnetically now. It's like, okay, what is that exactly? Well, the... The biologist, atheist types say, well, it's an epiphenomena. It's like, yeah, yeah. You can't describe something as a spandrel or an epiphenomena unless you have a theory of its existence. You can't just dismiss it. Human religious sentiment and belief, for that matter, is a human universal. There's no hand-waving it away any more than you can hand-wave away the human proclivity for language. You have to contend with it. And we don't contend with it. And it's much deeper than that. Like, I've just barely scraped, I've just barely touched the surface here. You know, because the, the primary religious impulse, which I would say is the impulse to the experience of meaning, is actually a marker. It's an extension of a very fundamental instinct, the orienting reflex, very fundamental instinct towards the unknown, which automatically orients you towards the unknown. It's the instinct of meaning. And we also tend to think of meaning as epiphenomenal, although there were philosophers who didn't, like Heidegger, for example, who thought that meaning was the primary phenomena and made a very strong case for it. Meaning is the instinct that tells you that you're sufficiently secure and sufficiently exploring at the same time. It's a deep instinct, and it places you in the right place at the right time. And there's something of religious significance about that from the experienced state. But I also think there might be something significant of it far beyond that. Well, those are other things that we don't have serious conversations about. Right. So beyond that being what? Well, who knows what you can accomplish if you're in the right place at the right time. Like we have no idea what the upper limits of human ability are. Right. Like, you know, you know perfectly well that there's a difference between how catastrophic your life goes when you let everything go to hell. 
It's bad for you. It's bad for your family. It's bad for the community. It can really be bad. You can make things really, really bad. Well, you can also make them really, really good. And you know, you think, well, what difference does it make? We're all dead in a million years, which is a hell of a way to think about things, you know? But I don't know what difference it makes if we order things. We're the only conscious slash self-conscious beings that we know. We're the most complicated things in creation, in the cosmos, as far as we know. Who knows what the significance of us getting ourselves together is? And I'm not willing to buy the party line of, you know, we're dust motes on another dust moat in a meaningless cosmos. It's like, no, sorry, I've seen where that line of reasoning goes. I don't think I want to go there. It leads to a nihilistic worldview, and, and, and you don't stop with nihilism. That's just the starting point for a very terrible descent. So I think it's much more accurate to think, and this is the story that's laid out in the corpus of the biblical stories, that human beings, the capacity that human beings have for creative consciousness is best regarded as divine, and as part of the divine essence of, the, of, the, of, the, of being, and that we have a primary moral obligation to manifest that consciousness in the best of all possible manners and bring the best of all possible worlds into being. And I don't see that as merely epiphenomenal. I see it as central to the nature of reality. So, right. Okay, I, I, I think um, we should quickly talk about um, selfauthoring.com. Um, you're running a two for one promotion right now and for the listeners, can you give a brief description of what self-authoring is and why it's important? Well, you can either be someone to whom things happen, which I wouldn't recommend, or you can be someone who takes an active role in determining your own destiny. I was just reading the audio version of my first book today, recording at Maps of Meaning, and there's an ancient god in there, Marduk, who's a hero god who confronts the dragon of chaos and makes the world out of the combat as a consequence of the combat. And he's the determiner of destinies. That's how he's construed. And that's really what you want to be in your own life. It's like you do confront an infinite sea of potential. Some of that's past because the past isn't as fixed as you think it is because you don't understand it completely. Some of it's present, who you are right now, and some of it's future, who you could be. And your best bet, and this is a mythological idea, is to take conscious and voluntary control over the fact that you're out there sailing on sailing on the sea and that you can you can identify a star that can guide you that's the, your vision for who you could be and you can articulate out what it is that you want from your life and you can chart your course towards that and we've used the future authoring program in particular with university students and with men, for example, it, it seems to work better for men, especially men who aren't doing very well, strangely enough, and there's complicated reasons for that. We found at Mohawk College, for example, is that... There a, sorry, is there a lack of reflection in, in men, in general? No, I is just that... think men won't do anything unless they have a reason. Right. Their own reason, because they're not very agreeable. So if a man hasn't charted his course, he's just going to not do anything. Right. Because why do anything? Doing things is actually hard. So you need a reason. You need a real reason. And maybe you need a reason that reaches right down into the depths of your soul. Because there's plenty of things to overcome. Like if you don't have a real reason, someone will just push you over. And so and then you'll default to like more impulsive forms of gratification. You know, video game. I don't have anything against video games, by the way. But, you know, they shouldn't be your whole life. You're not out there in the adventure of the world. Well, you need to be. And the Future Authoring Program helps you develop a personal vision, I would say, of heaven and hell of where you could be in three to five years if everything went the way it should, if you were taking care of yourself, contrasted with the awful and dismal dwelling place you might manage if you let all your bad behaviors and bad habits take the upper hand. So you develop a vision first and then lay out a strategy. And if you, if you have college students do this, especially if they're men, especially if they're not doing very well, if they hadn't done very well in high school, especially if they're not in a program that's directed towards a specific professional end, so it's kind of ill-defined, ill it increases the probability that they'll stay in school by 50%. And 50%, like that's just, it's just an overwhelming amount. And I think the reason is, why do anything? Right? The default is to sit and not do. Well, that's misery, man. 
That's misery. So you need to do something. And in the future authoring program, you're encouraged to, well, you're encouraged, first of all, to take courage. But more specifically, you're encouraged to treat yourself like someone you have a moral obligation to do well for. That's not self-esteem or self-liking or anything like that. It's an obligation. Like you're a, you're a valuable being among other valuable beings and you should do everything you can to foster your What would you say? You should do everything you can to become everything you can just to find out what you might be like. There's an adventure for you. Well, if you do that, then things get better. And I've had thousands and thousands of letters from people now, tens of thousands of letters saying exactly that. People have written and said, look, I've decided to start treating myself properly. I was in the dark place. It wasn't good for all sorts of the reasons that people get into dark places. I've made a goal. I've developed a vision. I've made a goal. I'm trying to be responsible. I'm taking, I'm disciplining myself and I'm trying to tell the truth and things are way better. It's like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. See how good you can make them. There's an adventure for your life. Life is terrible. It's full of suffering and malevolence and betrayal and everything, everything terrible that human beings can do to one another, plus everything terrible that the planet can do to you. That's the baseline condition of existence. Well, what you're charged to do is to move forward in, in spite of that and to make everything you can as good as it can possibly be. Well, that'll get you out of bed in the morning. And you need a reason for that. And I think that's especially true if you're a man. You need a voluntary reason. I think with women, the situation is different because they've already kind of got their hands full. Obviously, especially now in, in the modern West, they're out pursuing careers and everyone's encouraging that. And that's like a new adventure in some sense. But they also have the fact of childcare and, 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 and child rearing and pregnancy and all of that to deal with. So their destiny in some sense is perhaps it doesn't need to be crafted in quite exactly the same manner. Or perhaps it's not as possible for women to be as useless as it's possible for men to be. Because men can be spectacularly useful, but they can also be spectacularly useless. Whereas with women, it's more like the default is utility. And, and I think that's also true biologically, because what you see, especially in sexually dimorphic species like human beings, we're not that dimorphic, but we're somewhat dimorphic, is that the range of utility of the males is wider than the range of utility of the females. And so that means there's more useless males and more hyper useful males, and whereas the females tend to be crushed more into the middle of the distribution. Okay, the radical right, the Nazis, bad news, right? Okay, everyone agrees on that. Yeah. The radical left. Bad news, right? 100 million corpses, something like that? Okay. How do you know when you've become too radical on the left? The answer is, we don't know. Well, no, sorry, wrong answer. So the radical leftists have plenty of house to sort out before they start making pronouncements about biological reality. They refuse to do it because they won't take on the moral responsibility of determining when their hypothetically compassion-based morality has gone too far. So, I've got no liking whatsoever for the radical leftists. I think they're as reprehensible as the Nazis, except that the Nazis at least have identified themselves. You know who the hell they are. And they can come out and parade around as dramatically evil and accept that. Whereas the radical leftists still wear this cloak of compassion despite the fact that they're philosophical precursors killed a hundred million people. It's like, so, you know, their pronouncements on gender theory, it's like, it's an indication of the absolute corruption of the universities. There's right. no excuse for it. The evidence that human beings are sexually dimorphic, physiologically, psychophysiologically -physi dimorphic, is absolutely overwhelming. No reasonable biologist di disputes the fact that there are, on average, differences between men and women. Differences that, if you add them up, are enough to segregate the genders, the sexes, completely. That's, that's not pseudoscience. It's not the opinion of some extremists. The only people who don't believe that are not-headed social constructionists who've been raised on a diet of, like, Judith Butler and Foucault. Right. So. All right. Well, I would love to do this forever, but we got to get you on stage in a couple minutes. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, this has been the Penguin Philosophy Podcast with Jordan Peterson, and let art and science inspire. Thank you.